All right, so it's 111, so I guess we'll just get started. So, hello, uh, my name is Alex Long, and I'm currently a program assistant in the Science and Technology Innovation Program at the Wilson Center. Um, and I'm actually a graduate student for the next 20 hours. So, <laughs> yes, very exciting. Um, and I'm here presenting the Health Data and Complexity panel, and I'll be the moderator. And this comes from a lot of things, but that is a quite a spanning title, I would say, for a talk. And I think that that's kind of what we're trying to convey here, because now more than ever, when you look at public health and human health, you can't just talk about human-to-human -human transmission. And that's where this idea of the One Health framework, which is going to be stressed throughout our panel, comes into play. And you, you need to talk about the nexus between humans, animals, and the environment, and how they interplay and how that now affects our human health and the health of everything around us. Um, and with NASA's Earth, Earth observation uh, data and data sets, that opens up a whole new lexicon for us to work from. And it's really exciting because I'm not sure how many people think public health and then think NASA and then think precipitation and then think green. Because <laughs> like, I don't, and I didn't until I saw these talks six months ago and immediately was thinking, we need a public health panel, we need a One Health panel, we need a panel with people to talk about how just enormous the scope of this data that was presented by Dr. Jitla, Zytek, Zytek and um, Wimberly and Caldwell were um, all like presented today. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce everyone on the panel, and then we'll get right into the presentations for time's sake. So first, uh, Dr. John Balbus, who's the Senior Advisor for Public Health to the Director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Dr. Bernadette Dunham, a professor, professorial lecturer focusing on One Health at the Milken Institute School of Public Health at George Washington University. Dr. Helena Chaplin, uh, Ch Chapman, currently a AAAS uh, Science and Technology Policy Fellow at NASA Applied Sciences Program. Nicole Wyant, a Principal Investigator at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Research and Development Center uh, in the Geospatial Laboratory. And Dr. Christina Schneider, a veterinary doctor and epidemiologist who works as an advisor in human and health interface at the Infection Hazard Management Unit of the Pan American Health Organization Health Emergency Department, PAHO, WHO. <laughs> um, so without further ado, we'll get to the first presentation. Thanks very much, Alex. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back after lunch. Um, so what I'm going to try to do in a very short period of time is answer simple questions like how do climate, climate variability, and climate change affect waterborne and vector-borne diseases? How does the public health community deal with them now, and how can that information be used by the public health community in seven minutes? Um, <laughs> I'm going to try to go quickly and lay a kind of conceptual framework with some examples, and then the other panelists, I think, will do a great job of fleshing this out. Um, so let me just make sure I know how everything's working. Uh, so this is just a slide to talk about the complexity of the system. Um, Lawrence Riedel, when he started us off, was saying what we really need to be able to do is to take what we're doing really well in one place and replicate it in many other places. This slide is saying that there are many different places where diseases are emerging. In many places, the diseases are emerging because of or influenced by climate and climate variability. Um, but the context is very local, and the ability to generalize or replicate is often very limited because these systems are complex, the species are very adapted to a very local niche, the circumstances of the human context can be very different, the human ways of controlling, the human behaviors are very different in different places. So first point is just there's a lot of different ways that this application happens, and generalizing is kind of complicated. The second thing, reason I show a map of the world is that the conditions that may lead to emergence of a disease in one place um, may be very relevant for another place because of globalization and human transportation. So if we're looking at the risks of a Zika infection in Miami, we may not be so worried about the time series data of precipitation and temperature in Miami over the last three years. We may be <coughs> needing to look at a, another place in the Caribbean or Brazil or even West Africa. So just two quick points about um, from a public health perspective, sometimes it's not so much the local environmental data, but we have to be looking at both human transport and where those diseases were, were emerging from. 
So we've talked a little bit about um, West Nile virus. I just show this as an example of how do climate and climate variability interact with these complex disease systems. This is a figure from our most recent climate health assessment from 2016. If you haven't seen it, please Google GCRP climate health assessment 2016. Um, it is a very definitive assessment of the literature. Um, but West Nile virus, as we know, has different species involved. We have uh, the primary transmission and, and amplification occurs in birds. And so climate, the seasonality of climate, when do birds migrate, is the very starting point. And then on top of that, we have the vector issues. So the mosquitoes have to be able to replicate, bite the birds at the time when the birds are all congregating in close proximity by water holes, and then have the conditions for their own replication and for the virus to then amplify within the mosquitoes. And those things are not so much seasonal, although seasonality plays a role of when the m mosquitoes emerge, but the day-to-day -day precipitation, especially temperature, for the viral amplification within the host. And then, once the viruses are uh, infected and there's a cycle going on in, in, in the viruses, in the mosquitoes and the birds, then that's where the human behavior comes into play. And that's where most of the public health intervention is often taking place with West Nile virus, actually, is in modifying the human behaviors. So a complex system in which climate, seasonality, as well as day-to-day -day climate variability and extremes all play a role. Um, this is another, just a, a kind of conceptual figure uh, that illustrates a lot of what we heard yes, uh, in the panel earlier this morning, that climate, climate variability have uh, an amplifying role, they have an influence, they can be in places where there are thresholds, they can be a starting point, but that all of this occurs in a context of other factors, some of which can be more important actually for what's going on with an infectious disease. And so this is showing kind of an influence diagram based on the exposure pathways model we had in the climate health assessment for Lyme disease. And we know that a lot of the spread and emergence of Lyme disease, even though it may take place in a facilitating climate and weather situation, a lot of that has to do with land use patterns, the, the, the growth of deer and, and, and mice and, and the incursion of human habitation in, in this very uh, interdigitated pattern within the reforestation of the East Coast. So all of these things have to be taken into account in modeling, especially if we're talking about longer term climate change and longer term scenarios. Uh, but this just shows some of the climate drivers that are associated with Lyme disease. So again, there's a big seasonality aspect. When is the last frost? When, you know, is the, uh, is, and, um, you know, what are the temperatures like within an early spring that may amplify the, the beginning of the, the tick life stage? But then precipitation patterns, temperatures, all of these things come into play uh, in this interaction. So just to go through it one more time, because this is one of the goals of this the workshop, there were, these are the various ways that climate and clim climate variability can affect disease transmission. Um, and there is this difference between seasonality and climate and day-to-day -day or weekly uh, kind of climate variability phenomena. And of course, climate change affects both the seasonality, so we know that um, the onset of spring is happening earlier and earlier. This is leading to higher pollen seasons. It could lead to earlier tick um, amplification. Um, so climate change has a role in terms of the seasonality. Of course, it also has a, a role in terms of the extremes of drought, precipitation, temperature, et cetera. So shifting gears now, that's the climate variability. So how does this interact with the way public health people think and the way public he health people intervene. Um, and in many ways, we're not there yet. There's a bit of a disconnect. Um, so the current state of public health is very, very heavily reliant, as, as Michael said, on, on our definition of surveillance, which is early case finding, early diagnosis, early treatment. Um, there is mosquito vector control in many places, especially in the United States. It's not all that well developed. There is not a central mosquito database. Um, it's very variable depending on where you go. But that's, all, you know, spraying is one of the main ways that the public health community intervenes. And then, of course, the biggest way the public health system will intervene is, is with behavioral intervention, with advisories. Wear long sleeves if you're going out. Don't go outside <coughs> at dusk and dawn. These kinds of things to try to focus on the human behavior. For time reasons, I'm just going to have to kind of go quickly through this. But again, the, 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 the state of, of the art in public health control is primarily, I want to make the case, responsive. 
It's early detection of the outbreak in humans for the most part, which is why a One Health approach looking for sentinel species, or as we're, going to, as we're discussing here, the possibility of using environmental and, and, and climatic drivers to be able to predict months ahead of the first human case. The question is, can we incorporate that into the current workings of the public health system? Um, so I, I just want to lay out, there's, there's three different realms in which the activity of integrating earth and, and weather observations with public health systems can occur. What we heard this morning is primarily observational <coughs> studies, primarily trying to understand the mechanisms, although Michael has given some examples of early efforts to operationalize and to interact very closely with the public health system in, in Amhara to be able to start getting those predictions. And we heard also of efforts um, from Rita Caldwell and Antar to try to you know, start to provide that integration with the public health system to operationalize prediction um, for, for Yemen and, and for the uh, Bay of Bengal. So we can talk about this mechanistic research, which informs our modeling. And then I just want to emphasize that there are two different timescales that we are thinking about. One is a seasonal to sub-seasonal timescale of climate variability, which is where the public health system is going to live for the most part. Um, the public health system does not, it makes some decisions on the long term about infrastructure, about you know, vaccine programs on a global scale wi where to base certain kinds of diseases. But most of the decision making in public health is on a very immediate responsive basis. These are very different things. You know, if you're a climatologist, you'll, you may be nodding your head because the, 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 you, the, the kind of prediction and data systems that we're using for public health tend to be shorter term than the longer term climate change. But of course, when we think about the impacts of climate <coughs> change, we need to be able to assess and predict what happens on a longer time scale. And the disconnect between those timescales from a meteorologic, climatological point of view is very important. So um, this is very similar to, to, the, um, to the figure that was shown earlier. Uh, again, just emphasizing that the typical public health response relies on finding the first case, having that first case detected, confirming it in a lab, which can sometimes take a while in a human health system. Uh, and then you get the response once the outbreak is already well underway. Um, by the time the response really takes hold, that's about the time that most epidemics are often dying out anyway for natural reasons. And so the model is not necessarily the best in terms of being able to really control outbreaks. And um, it's not well shown here, but um, if we can somehow get into the time scale of subseasonal forecasts, as, as we've seen earlier on the panel, and, and put in place the vector control measures, the human behavioral measures perhaps, the bed nets, the, the vector control, um, ahead of that first case, the idea is to prevent the bulk of that epidemic from occurring. Um, I'm, I'm showing this. This was actually shown by Michael, and I'm, I'm borrowing it from Michael, um, from his work in Anamhara. Just to make the case, I, I want to focus on um, the top slide, which is showing the, the time scale of <coughs> prediction. So there, there's two main points here. One is that in the, in the case of operationalizing it, the prediction of cases, the prediction of the epidemic isn't based solely on the climate and the environmental factors. It's very much the integration of the climate and environmental drivers, the short-term forecast in weeks to months with the ongoing surveillance and detection of cases. So that is the only way right now that we're operationalizing and having a product that is of you know, sufficient quality to, to really be able to rely on from a public health standpoint for interventions. A little bit of an overstatement, but not too much of an overstatement. Um, and again, in the interest of time, I'm going to leave it to our other panelists to flesh out a lot of these ideas. They, they will be doing this in a, in a wonderful way with specific examples. I just want to uh, make one shameless plug uh, for the educators in the audience um, that raising the awareness within the public health community about the linkages between environment and climate drivers and diseases is very, very important for getting the public health community to start accepting this data. And so we have a project at NIEHS. We have educational materials that are um, useful in both a, a K through 12, but also in a health and professional graduate school uh, setting to help to teach these links. So for those of you who are educators and interested, please talk to me afterwards. Thanks very much. And then so next up we have um, Dr. Dunham and Dr. Chapman. Thank you. <coughs> well, thank you very much. And we're delighted to be here today. Um, 
I'm going to give you the one health approach to today's presentation, and I'll move it right along. Let's see if I can do this one right. Uh, okay. Um, no, that's not what I want to do. <laughs> okay. So if we define One Health, some people do know what One Health is, other people may not. Basically, uh, One Health has been around since Hippocrates, as you heard earlier this morning. It's an awareness of our environment. It's actually realizing that animal health, human health, and plant and environmental health we are all inextricably linked. And it took the American Veterinary Medical Association in 2008 to set up that definition, followed by the American Medical Association the following year. It's really recognizing that we just want to bring multiple disciplines together. And so when we do that, um, at any rate, we'll find um, out. I'll stay with the One Health umbrella instead. I do apologize. Um, this gives you this. I'm not touching it. Okay. <laughs> 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 um, the One Health umbrella is the best way of looking at One Health. <coughs> Nested underneath this umbrella are the various disciplines that you can think of, and I've highlighted a few of them here. We are all interactive, so you can drill down and go and look at food safety issues from a zoonotic infection, antimicrobial resistance, cancer and cardiovascular disease in humans and animals, and bring it back and cross it over and say, who should I have at the table to work on these issues? And rather than staying in a silo and working by yourself, we can accomplish so much more when we reach across the aisle and work together. And that's really what we're talking about. Under this broad umbrella of One Health, let's work together. Now, let's see if I can advance this slide because I'll close it. Okay. So today, we're hearing a lot about mosquitoes, and I put this up specifically because, don't forget, you have dogs and cats. They might end up having heartworm disease. Mosquitoes transmit that. And you certainly wouldn't want your pet's heart to be full of worms like that. As far as Zika, very important. Zika was the story that brought us all together to realize how many disciplines we need to address those issues. Not only your physicians, your veterinarians, your entomologists, but your government officials too. Taking care of these children is very, very challenging. How do you develop vaccines? And for malaria, what's interesting right now, and it was mentioned this morning, we have new technologies. CRISPR-Cas9, on a research model, we've been able to alter the immunity of this mosquito so it actually rejects the Plasmodium faciliparum parasite and doesn't transmit malaria. Potentials are out there and it's very, very exciting. And when we take a look at climate change, definitely One Health, these pictures will tell a thousand words, and you've heard a lot of these in the news. How do you then bring people together to react <coughs> and address these challenges from not only an emergency situation, but prevention? How do we turn around and restore our coral reefs? How do we be able to prevent, if we can, some of the algal blooms that are very important? And at the same time, air pollution, how do we deal with that? Technology has given us a lot, but it's also harmed us. So when we take a look at the One Health approach, it always comes down to how do you make that personable? How do I relate to it from my family? How do you relate to it? And what can I as a single person do? When you bring each one of these issues down, that's how you work together, and you can make a difference. And this afternoon's session of Citizen Scientists is going to highlight a lot of that. So the One Health opportunities they're here. You can relate to any one of these entities, and it's really all of us working together. And many times people forget just how much interactions we have with the plants, with the animals, with our overall environmental issues that we face every single day. And most recently, the World Bank has released their One Health operational framework, just came out in April. It's strengthening human and animal and environmental public health systems at the interface. We've already seen WHO and PAHO, OIE, embrace One Health. It's been codified in many governments around the world right now. It's really that. How do we all work together? And there's three websites which I highly recommend you take a look at for more details on One Health. One is the One Health Initiative website, followed by the One Health Commission website. Those two are here in the States. And the One Health platform is in Brussels, Belgium. They're excellent resources to go to for information on One Health. 
And in 2016, we had our very first One Health Day internationally. So it's recognizing and people are showcasing all the things that they're doing to really say, how do I reach across the aisle? How do I bring disciplines that I never would have thought of before to the table? And this particular symposium today is doing just that. How do we access the tools that we didn't realize would be applicable that can help us now address these very important issues and improve our overall public health? So thank you for your time. Kept the time limit. Uh, thank you, Bernadette. Um, following along with this One Health um, connection of all of us here in the room, um, uh, um, looking at these healthy environments and looking at how we can continue to balance with humans, animals, and the environment, um, the WHO reported that 12.6 million deaths, or one in four, are associated with residing or working in unhealthy environments. And in addition to that, one of the leading causes of environmental health risks is air pollution, and 6.5 million annual deaths, or one in nine, are associated with air pollution. So this is everyone interacting together, humans, animals, and the environment, and can lead to an array of infectious and chronic diseases that lead to our burden across the planet. Some of these factors were previously mentioned in this panel, um, starting with antimicrobial resistance and that has led to from uh, uh, inappropriate antimicrobial practices, prescribing practices both in humans and in animals, um, leading to the proximity of humans and animals and how we live within the environment. Um, with international travel and the ease to hop on an airplane and be in another geography that same day. Um, the public health practices and the vector controls that we have in other countries with fumigation and how that has led to um, so sometimes a reemergence of diseases such as dengue fever and the trend of, mi of migration of communities from rural to urban environments have led to also the creation of megacities across the globe. Um, and just the incidence of different types of natural hazards, so in this case whether it's flooding, whether it's hurricanes or earthquakes. All of this leads to globalization and the health of our ecosystems that we're dealing with, with how humans, animals, and the environment, and how we all live together. And how we really need to look today, this whole workshop has been looking at creative imagination using the resources that we are currently knowledgeable of and those that we can learn and continue to learn about as well as look at those experts and be able to consult with them to be able to really create greater scientific advances. And in that, um, we would like to promote this One Health Toolkit, um, basically looking at what are the tools that we can have that we are currently knowledgeable of and that we can continue to strengthen. Especially when we look at greater goals, such as the Sustainable Development Goals, how can we use our toolkit to be able to look at some of the targets and the different health indicators across the 17 current um, Sustainable Development Goals? But also, what do we have? What are the different computer applications? What kind of capacity building programs do we need to strengthen? Um, and what are those um, sources of data that we may or may not be aware of? So today, we've been focusing on Earth observations, which um, some are end users in our public health community, but some public health um, end users are not aware of the importance that we could use with Earth observations. And to use one example from our NASA portfolio to really this real life application in public health is looking at these harmful algal blooms, for example, across the Florida Gulf Coast. So with the um, harmful algal blooms, they do create this, they have the chance of creating this red tide across the Florida Gulf. And so the goal of this project was to look at daily respiratory forecasts um, to be able to have that across the Gulf Coast. And so in this project, they were able to use Earth observations to be able to identify um, the location of these um, harmful algal blooms, but in itself also involved the opportunity of citizen scientists. So creating something called a HABScope, where you are able to have a community citizen with a filter apply that to the, cell to the camera and be able to send that fixture to a scientist who can be able to evaluate that without actually seeing the sample at hand, and that being able to use integrated with the satellite data, and in itself, from that, they were able to not only improve the forecasting of these um, for, um, for respiratory distress forecast one to two times um, per day and with more accuracy than what was previously used, which was one to times two per week without as much accuracy. And so this is an example of real life application where not only we're using a new data set or a data set that exists but maybe new to some end users and be able to apply that together with some citizen science um, and be able to incorporate both because this red tide affects both marine life, humans, and, and the environment. 
Um, and so really looking at this One Health Toolkit is what we would like to promote in our, in our uh, Bernadette and my section, um, is looking at how we can continue to strengthen our toolkit, the skills that we have, the skills that we do need to have, and we don't have to be experts in the use of Earth observations, but as long as we know who we can consult with, we can be able to use those tools to be able to create real and innovative scientific advancements. Thank you. Next up is Nicole Wyant. Yep. Oh, actually. Wait. I can still. Okay, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> this one's not the most. <laughs> <laughs> I'm short, so I can sit in that one. <laughs> All right, wonderful. This afternoon, I'm going to be. Oh, which button do I have to push since so many people have had trouble yeah, with it? Yeah, that one right there? Maybe that one. Let's see. Ah. Yeah, there we go. I learn about the technology before I have to use it. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we try to do it. Today I'm going to be talking to you about a project that we are con uh, doing at the Geospatial Research Laboratory, and it's underneath the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Now, one of the questions you might be asking yourself is, why does the Army care about vector-borne diseases? Well, there are three main reasons that we are going to be discussing today. The first one has to do with force readiness. More service members are hospitalized due to infectious disease than are injured in combat. In Vietnam, about 25% of all soldiers were infected with malaria. So basically what it comes down to is if you're sick, you can't complete your mission. The second reason is that we are seeing an increase in globalization across the world. By the year 2030, it's predicted that about 70% of the world's population will live within a city. And what that means is that we're seeing a lot of really quick buildup that's unplanned in a lot of these urban areas, which means we have peri-urban zones, shanty towns, slums, and these regions, not only do they not have good sanitation and water supply that lead to, uh, to waterborne diseases, but it's also a breeding ground for many of the vectors that carry vector-borne diseases. For example, the mosquito that, uh, that will transmit dengue, it can breed in as much water as an upside-down bottle cap, which to me is very scary. The third reason that we're going to focus on today, or that the reason that the Army is interested in disease, is that our world is changing. As our climate is warming up, the habitat for many of these vectors is expanding, and as we have shorter and less uh, harsh winters, the amount of time that they can be spreading diseases is growing as well. Also, the vectors themselves are evolving and adapting to many of the chemicals that we use to combat them, and the diseases themselves are adapting to the medicines that we use to treat them. For example, there is a strand of malaria in Southeast Asia that is now resistant to anti-malaria drugs. That's why it's so important that we know when and where we think these diseases are going to be occurring and be able to predict the intensity with which we think that will occur. So the project that we are doing at GRL is known as Based Safer, uh, Safer uh, Spatial, uh, I don't even remember, Spatial Analytics Force Health Readiness. There we go. And there's three main parts to our project. And the very first step has to do with finding a uniform pixel size. We've heard a lot today about how the environment is so related to all these different vector and waterborne diseases that we're studying. And we obtain a lot of this information from our, our NASA centers, um, sensors. But the problem is that a lot of these different uh, data sets have different spatial resolutions. Some may have a resolution of eight kilometers, one kilometer, or even two meters. Now, in the past, or what's commonly done when we need to, to put all this information together to figure out where these diseases are occurring, is we kind of aggregate up to the coarsest uh, resolution. But when we do that, we introduce a lot of error, and we're not stopping to think about the uncertainty um, that, we're, that we're adding, and we also we're, we're losing a lot of information. For, so the very first step of our project is to be able to figure out what that uniform pixel size is and maybe scale down a little bit from that really coarse resolution um, and then and, and scale up from the finest resolution, kind of find that middle ground. Our very first step of finding the uniform pixel size feeds into our second step, which is being able to downscale from provincial level statistics down to a pixel level. Um, one of the problems that we've personally found with dealing with epidemiological data is that it has a very coarse spatial and temporal resolution. A lot of times we, when we were scourging the web, um, we could only find 
a continuous uh, temporal data set of, of cases um, on either a country by country basis or on a province by province basis. And while that's wonderful, it doesn't give us an idea of the spatial distribution of disease incidents throughout a region. And so what we're doing is that we are taking a lot of these environmentally derived uh, data sets like, such as TRIM and MODIS um, when in uh, vegetation indices to be able to downscale from provincial level statistics down to the pixel level. So the map that you're seeing here in the, the middle section of the slide, it is taking province level uh, dengue incidents and downscaling them to about a 100 meter uh, pixel. And that is all done taking those environmental data sets plus population density, and we throw it into a machine learning algorithm, in this case, random forests, and we go from the provincial level statistics, that, that map up on the, the higher side, and then we do our magic with our random forests, and we can downscale it to, um, to a pixel level, which was uniform, which we got from step number one. It all feeds into each other. And so that gives us a better idea of the spatial distribution of disease incidents around the region. And then we feed that, we feed step number two into step number three. And we feed it into a stochastic model, a modified Ross McDonald model, where we simulate how a disease, in this case dengue, is moving throughout both the human and the mosquito population. So it moves through four different sections. One, we're susceptible to the disease. Two, we've been exposed. Uh, three, we are now infected. And four, we have recovered or been removed from the disease. Um, so it gives us an idea for how the disease is moving through the human and mosquito populations. And then if we put that on a map, we can kind of see temporally how it's moving uh, throughout the region. So I don't want you to get scared by this map. We put in a very high uh, infection rate because it puts a lot of colors on the map. And it <laughs> our leadership really likes that, and then they want to keep funding our project. Um, so this is a very high uh, incident rate if, if everybody's getting you know infected really quickly. And it's a map of the proportion of the population that has recovered from dengue. So it's a proportion of the population that got sick, and they are now better. So this is going over a 90-day time period. And it kind of gives us an idea of how uh, the disease spread and, and who got better. We can do this for all four sections of our, our disease model, our, our stochastic model as we were talking about, the susceptible, exposed, infected, and removed. And just yesterday I was talking to somebody on my team that he thinks he can now do it for mosquitoes as well. So this is, this is for humans. Um, we're working on expanding this to other vector-borne diseases and vectors themselves. Um, that's, that's about it for our project. Thank you. And last up, Dr. Schneider. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today in this workshop and share some examples how we at PAHO are using environmental data to better analyze infection disease. Oops, I'm in the right place. Is this one? I thought that. so. Yeah. Okay, good. Oops. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> no, <laughs> Not <very> bad. <laughs> uh, no. First of all, I would like to uh, repeat the same thing that my, uh, my colleague Bernadette uh, just uh, talked about the importance in the Kuro world to have this integrated vision that we're all together here, humans, animals, the environmental, now the one health vision approach. And we really need to work in collaboration, sectors, uh, disciplines to achieve better results and have better decision making. Uh, as was mentioned, I work in PAHO Health Emergency and very close to international health regulation. And for us, uh, surveillance data, risk analysis to, uh, is our everyday basis to see if a new event could be uh, turned in an international concern, like was the pandemic, like was uh, Zika, and, uh, and many other ones. And we really use information <laughs> there too. <laughs> to do this type of analysis. And what I will be presenting here is a few examples uh, that uh, we are trying to understand the drivers of infection disease. In my case, I'm more linked to leptospirosis, this disease that I work 
directly uh, to better uh, understand the disease and do prediction. This first study was done uh, with Nicaragua. Uh, the decision maker, the government, was part of this study. It's their own data that we help to analyze. Now, we characterize the higher risk area, the hotspots, mostly in the Pacific coast. <coughs> and uh, also, we try to understand the drivers of this. Nicaragua was facing many outbreaks of leptospirosis, mostly after flood. And uh, we figured out in this study uh, that soil was a very strong relation with Leptospira. This type of volcanic origin soil, it's a uh, very sweet type of like the, like the bacteria because the pH, the humidity, and many things that is good for the bacteria to survive longer. No? We analyzed many possible drivers, socioeconomics, demographics, and also environmental. The other thing that was important was the rainfall. We already know that leptospirosis is very related to, to <laughs> rainfall <laughs> the, uh, after flood. But we distribute the cases among the months and the precipitation, and you could see very clear a concentration of cases in the months of September. No? And for the decision maker, we use this information. In the case of Nicaragua, they really use this information to their national plan. If you know the high risk areas and you know the, the period of the year that the cases increase, you can organize your strategy. Now, before the rain seasons, do vector control. Now, during the rain season, alert the population that if you have fever, go to the health service. And remember the physicians, this leptospirosis time, be ready to, <laughs> to treat cases. No? This is, could really be used in everyday basis. Another study that we did, this is my state, Rio do Sul, in the south of Brazil. <laughs> we also work with the government, uh, state uh, health authorities, agriculture uh, authorities, and the local university. And we found the relationship of ecoregion. You can see that area of, uh, with many concentration of cases, the green area, Paraná, Paranapaíba ecoregion. Also comes the, with the ecoregion, the soil was again related. It is again the type of soil that uh, have this certain time of pH and uh, humidity and all the things. And uh, this time we are able to analyze the the plantations, what kind of use the people give to the soil. No? Paddy rice was association, but then it's, it's already known. Many outbreaks are in, in paddy rice, but we found a relation with tobacco plantation. Again, because the tobacco and the leptospira like the same type of soil. No? And in this study, too, we are able to include the bovines, like the One Health approach. Uh, the university provides a number of bovines by property. An area with a smaller number of animals by property have a higher risk of leptospirosis. Another study was done in, in yellow fever. We really work in a multidisciplinary team. No, uh, Sylvain is a physician. Patricia is a geographer, the first author of this paper. And this was yellow fever, 15 years of uh, data from all the Latin American region, all the countries endemic. And in this case, it was related to altitude, temperature, and, and rainfall. And also, Patricia found the layers of the non-human primates, the monkeys. And it uh, looks like if you have more genera, more different types of monkey, increase the risk of, uh, of yellow <coughs> fever. Because some monkey, uh, monkeys die very fast, and the other keep the infection longer. Now, one more example <laughs> of one health. And why this is important to understand the drivers of infection disease? Because you could better understand the disease. Now, then you can do predictions. Uh, for example, this yellow fever map we did, we finished just before the start the outbreak in Brazil. And when the cases uh, of uh, yellow fever start growing in the state of Minas Gerais, we saw in the map that the, uh, there is a continuation of the ecoregion in direction of the Espiritu Santo. And then our uh, supervisor, Paho team, went to Brazil to talk with the national authorities to suggest and to start the vaccination and people 
uh, before the monkeys <laughs> arrive there with the epizootee and really helps to, to save lives and av avoid cases. Now, if you can understand better what the disease could done. And this uh, last uh, a, a map was plague. Plague is uh, also a disease that many people, well, US, you have wild plague <laughs> in some areas, but in South America, they think that is gone. Now, only a few cases in Peru. But the risk persists because it stay in the wild for a long time. Like there was a window of 20, 30 years could reemerge from the wild animals and have human cases. And then you need to know where is the risk areas because then you need to alert the health uh, personnel, the, the decision maker, is a plague area. You need to be aware and need be ready to treat in case of something happened. No? And we wrote uh, recently to, to Lancet Planetary Health some comments and telling the importance of this approach. No? Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so now we'll get to the question part of the panel. I'll ask one question, and then we'll open up to the audience. Um, so first question, uh, I think that this kind of encapsulates like health data and then complexity, which is just such a large word. Um, so like, what makes environmental, climate, earth ops data actionable, or how easy or feasible is it to go from a data set that's publicly available to an actual protocol or an action on behalf of an organization or a research like conglomerate. Who wants to go first? <laughs> it's a pretty big question. Yes. Um, and it would help to know exactly what you mean by actionable, but I, I think that um, there are, I think we've laid out the kind of steps that are needed, you know, in many cases, Earth observations data in the form that Earth scientists use them are not in the form that health scientists are, are readily able to use them. So there's often some reanalysis or, you know, parameterization of, of, of the raw Earth observations data is needed for, for use in, in public health science. The second thing is that there needs to be years of research to actually be able to understand mechanisms and be able to have confidence in the results of, of any kind of, of models. And then the third thing is that you have to have the relationship with the actual end users uh, and that, you know, if you're PAHO, you, you have that. Um, that's your mandate. And so you can reach out to the state of, of Brazil. But if you're an academic researcher like Mike Wimberly, you know, you, you have to build that up over many years of collaboration. So those are at least some of the stages. I think that's why you also need to have a wide variety of disciplines. And I thought the, 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 one, the one health really you know, drove that in when you have your veterinary scientist and you have your, if you have physicists, you have earth, earth scientists, if you can bring them all together, you're gonna get a lot more information than if you just focus on just public health scientists. You can get a lot of different perspectives from different disciplines. Uh, if I may, I, I think I agree with you. This takes years to have one of these maps. No? And for this reason, I really uh, believe in risk mapping and, and be, uh, be aware of what diseases and where and when this could happen and be prepared to respond. Because uh, then if you uh, you could work together with the uh, with the national authorities or local authorities to prepare this in advance. Uh, it's, I think it's uh, working together in, in advance with the major threats that you have could facilitate this collaboration and use of information. And if I just may add, uh, everything you said is perfect. Um, I think it gets back to the power of collaboration will also, I think, ingrain trust when you have consistency and you have well-respected organizations and groups and researchers, you know, literally sharing their data, working together, and then giving you the metrics and showcasing success stories. So you're right, you need the time with the data and analysis, but I think you have a power when you have multiple groups then echoing, we are together on this. Yeah. Sure, the, um, the only thing to add to um, this rich discussion is, I think just, I mean, when you look at um, degrees in public health, 
there are so many different avenues to go in that same degree. You can go um, the more you know mapping route. Um, you can go into more laboratory and drug resistance in, in an actual laboratory setting. You can go into the field and do field work in, uh, in a rural area or an urban area doing or you can even do social science work. And so I think that if we can increase within some of these schools um, of public health, of business, um, going across and being able to offer greater insight about the opportunities that are arising in using different types of data sets, um, and then that could then foster um, multidisciplinary collaborations across um, to be able to do greater innovative and scientific advancements. Do we have any questions from the audience? So, Ray Petrosen, I, I think it's been alluded to, but maybe not emphatically stated, the role of animal sentinels in this whole process, and perhaps some discussion on how it could link to Earth observation, the use of animal sentinels. So it's going to be disease system dependent. So you know, certainly for West Nile virus, there's extensive use of, of birds of, as animal sen sentinels. For a lot of the, you know, in the United States, a lot of the equine encephalitides are use animal sentinels of horses and 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 bovine species as well. And the point is really well made that um, to be actionable for the complex Earth observations data, for the remote sensing, for the sensor data to be actionable. You know, these systems are complex, and you have to combine it with the other data, but you also have to have the collaboration with the people who understand those data. And we, we do see this. We see this from the health side of health scientists trying to do, you know, climate modeling and climate modelers trying to do health. You, know, you really do have to have the collaboration of, of, of the different disciplines. So, um, you know, I, I think there are, are certain um, systems, like perhaps dengue in an urban area, that, that where the urban, the animal models aren't quite as essential, but in many of the, uh, uh, of the diseases, the amplification cycle is taking place in an animal reservoir first, and oftentimes we don't capture that as well as we should, and it, it, you know, that does give the lead time, and we have heard some examples of that, but it's, it's certainly a part of it. If I may, um, to build on that, I think what's really important is to realize just how much happens with animals and then moves to people. I think influenza is a very important role that you see. Um, in some countries, people are living literally with their animals. They're like right below them, they're beside them. Um, it's incredible that the exposure they get. And when we see that with avian influenza, with swine influenza, the potential to jump and move into species and cause illness in people, as well as the animals, is critical. To which I have to make a very important announcement. If you haven't seen already, the Smithsonian is going to open tomorrow outbreak. And this is 100 years since we've had the 1918 pandemic of influenza. And it showcases a tremendous amount of how much we've learned since that time, a lot more to go, but it really is the idea that we really should be watching what's happening in animals because they are the sentinels to take a look at if we want to try to minimize health in people, or disease in people, and what we can learn from them. So if you get a chance, it'll be here for about three years, um, but I'm ex excited to see it just opening uh, tomorrow, and it'll be a wonderful analysis of a One Health approach to these very important issues. And there'll be a pop-up of that tonight at the Hay Adams reception, <laughs> so you'll get a little preview. Only to mention something very simple. Uh, in the case of yellow fever, the, the monkeys are very important. No? And uh, for example, some countries like Brazil, they do surveillance in the monkeys that uh, if they found monkeys that are on the floor, the, there is a program that the government go there and get the monkeys and then do analysis. Then you can keep trapping of the episodia in uh, animals that usually arrive first that the human cases, no? It's very important. Yes, thank you. So, you know, we've talked about the role of building trust with the end users, with the operational partners. You talk about the longevity of research in the first panel as well. But we also talked about getting ahead of the curve and trying to advance our ability to forecast some of these. So my question relates to data uncertainty. So what is your perspective in terms of tracing data uncertainty from the actual data itself or the model into integrated research, the, the policy that's generated and ultimately des decision making. Where do you see communicating um, data uncertainty through that process, both from an academic side and from an operational side? Where, where should we go? What do you recommend? 
So you're using the term data uncertainty. Um, I guess my first reaction is that the climatologists that I deal with feel like their data are so uncertain, and the health people that I deal with see that their data are really uncertain. Everybody feels like their data are the most uncertain and that everybody else's are just cut and dried and, and very, very simple. Um, but of course, data uncertainty is only a small part of the uncertainty that we're talking about in building operational predictive models. So uh, there's model uncertainties of different kinds. There's parameter uncertainty. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a lot of different sources of uncertainty. Um, I think that, so I'm not exactly sure what, what question you are asking um, in terms of how do you deal with uncertainty and operationalizing and getting end users to accept and use these kind of predictive systems. Um, and, you know, I, I, it's, it's tricky because there have been settings in the United States where, you know, some vector-borne disease predictions come out and, um, you know, they're not perfect. And public health people have in some cases said, well, this isn't really, you know, I need something a, a little more. I, I think it's, it's uh, th there's not a simple answer to it. The, in general, the, the research base to be able to understand the uncertainty in the models is, is just not there. You have to have a lot of replication. You have to have a lot of studies, a long period of time. You know, we're pretty good in the United States on understanding the uncertainty of risk estimates for air pollution because we've invested hundreds of millions of dollars in, in that research. Not so much, you know, given the complexity, the multiplicity of species, diseases, et cetera, um, it's a little daunting. So, you know, I think it has to do with trust um, and the willingness to pilot and make mistakes uh, in a way that's safe, you know, and, and Mike t talks about no regrets kind of policies in an uncertain situation to start with. But there's not not a simple answer, and sorry I talk so long. No, no, you're. <laughs> I think Give we you all time to think and get the <laughs> coherent answers. I think that's why surveillance information is so important in the sharing of information. Because um, from a data scientist point of view, we want that surveillance information so we can validate our models. But then I think we need to just instead of being afraid of the uncertainty, embrace it. You know, have your confidence intervals and your root mean square errors and, and your probability. You know, there's nothing wrong with saying there's a probability of 80% that there will be this disease here. That doesn't mean that 20% is impossible. And again, in, in terms of embracing that uncertainty, like the earlier speakers were, were discussing, it's there, so don't ignore it. Um, we were talking with somebody from a disaster center that we're going to be integrating our models with, and she said, I don't care if you have a 20% uncertainty. It gives me somewhere to start. It gives me an idea of where I'm going, you know, at least the general, the general idea. So I think just knowing and acknowledging, hey, this uncertainty is here. My model is not perfect, but it's going to give you a starting place and give you an idea of what you need to have in your situation. So I totally agree with <laughs> my, co my colleagues in the panel. Yes, there is all this uncertainty. And for my case, that using gathering more health data, of course, is uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's some uh, proxy of the reality. Uh, for example, leptospirosis is a huge number that is mild disease that is not count, no, is not the number of cases because it don't even go to the health system. No? But uh, use the information that you have, but it's mentioned in the morning for another colleague, they always think that we can do something else. But no, if it's this information, do your best. Now, and leave certain uncertainty because always we'll have. Thank you. Um, the one thing that I wanted to add is my work in public health in a country like the Dominican Republic, um, when you look at, for example, tuberculosis, which was part of my dissertation, um, the data that is um, we always believe that there can be uncertainty in public health data. So I think, um, you know, looking at that, we already understand there is some sort of uncertainty. But just in collecting some of the national data from the Dominican Republic, you actually have to go to each hospital to be able to obtain that data. There is not um, a large with, you know, they have a number count, but actually date details behind that data, you would have to go to each specific hospital. That's how that works in that system. And so. Um, I think in general, as a public health practitioner, I personally understand that there's going to be uncertainty, but again, that's what you have and that's what you start with. 
and that you keep moving forward. Um, I did want to give a plug, though, for NASA. We do have two satellites the, the, that will be launched in the next couple of years, and one of them is called Maya, as you probably know, um, and that's where there's going to be a link. So being able to link the satellite data looking at air quality and combining that with epidemiologists and public health records of, um, you know, 12 plus mega cities across. So that, I think, from being able to combine different data sources might help, not solve, but might help with some of the um, being able to interlink all of the data together. I couldn't agree with more everything that's been said. And I think this comes back to one aspect of your question, and that is it's all about education. And this is a prime opportunity for us to help the public appreciate what does it take to get the science that they look to to give us answers and to give us new changes in treating and preventing disease and to realize that they can participate, I think, is also very important. But I do hear you all say, let's see how they can understand piloting something, gathering data, and understanding there will be some risk and there will be some error until we develop it. But to sit back, as you heard earlier this morning, wait till it's 100% perfect, you know, that's not the way we work. And we need to engage them so they're positive and working with us and realizing that, you know, you may stumble a little bit along the way, but look how much we've learned and look how far we've come. And I think showcasing those successes and continuing to find the metrics to be able to identify how we are making progress together and we will do it more effectively, more efficiently, and many times a little quicker when we do collaborate. And that's an education piece that the public, I think, really needs to have because they're embracing science then and they're learning an awful lot. And just one, one quick follow-up. You know, the hope is that by doing this collaboration that the quality of the data actually gets better over time. So, for example, from the public health side, public health surveillance data are primarily collected at the point of diagnosis at the hospitals and the, and the healthcare centers or by the physician's offices, which is not where the disease was contracted, right? But if we're looking at environmental and, and climatic drivers, what matters to our community is where it was contracted, not where the person ended up and getting, got diagnosed. So, you know, that is a huge uncertainty in the data of public health surveillance data. I mean, the, 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 the spatial characteristics are very poor for our environmental health uses. So hopefully, you know, as this collaboration builds, the systems can be put in place to enhance the quality of the data and, uh, you, know, you know, ultimately reduce the uncertainty. All right, so I think should we cut it off? Yeah, I think that's a good place to stop. So thank you so much to the panel, and we'll go on to the next one. So as we're changing panels, I'm glad you all are chatting, but we actually have a, a brief job posting announcement. Thank you. Well, so you'll hear more from Rusty Lowe about Globe Observer and the Mosquito Habitat Mapper, but we just posted today with Globe Observer, I guess I should say, I'm Kristen Weaver, I'm the Deputy Coordinator for Globe Observer, um, the Citizen Science Project. But we just posted today a position for a research scientist doing science outreach. So this is, um, so, so seeking a motivated and outgoing junior scientist support science outreach for Globe Observer, especially building support uh, in the science user base for using citizen science data, doing some research with the Globe Observer data with an emphasis on the mosquito habitat and NASA satellite data, and then also helping us report back to our citizen scientists about how the data is being used. So if you know anybody who might be interested in such a position, um, uh, it's going to be posted through uh, Science Systems and Applications, Inc., SSAI, um, and I, so if you... And if you have any questions, you can come find Rusty or you can f come find me later and we can uh, make sure you have the information to find it. So thank you.
for slides. Thank you very much, and welcome to the Citizen Science Panel. Uh, we've discussed this term a lot, but just to provide a baseline definition, citizen science is a process where the public contributes to scientific research to advance real-world goals. Many people associate citizen science with data collection on unprecedented scales and resolutions, and this is definitely true. Um, but volunteers also co-design or conduct studies of their own, including in community-based participatory research, and they analyze and interpret and act upon results. Citizen science crosses research domains. However, today we're going to hear about work that's been done on vector monitoring specifically, conducted by partners in the Global Mosquito Alert Consortium. This work aligns with the goals of today's workshop. Uh, and in addition, the consortium model, where a number of related projects come together to share best practices and exchange data, is unique and innovative in citizen science. Our first panelist is Dr. Rusty Lowe, a senior scientist at the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies in Arlington, Virginia. Dr. Lowe serves on the NASA Globe Observer team as the science lead for the Mosquito Habitat Mapper app. She is also PI for the Go Mosquito Challenge Community Campaign, funded by USAID's Combating Zika and Future Threats Initiative, piloting the app in high-risk communities in Brazil and Peru. Our second panelist is Dr. John Palmer, a tenure-track professor in the Department of Political and Social Sciences at Pompeu Fabra University. Uh, Dr. Palmer is a founding member of Mosquito Alert and the Global Mosquito Alert Consortium Initiative. He works on questions related to disease ecology, human mobility, and inequality in the Sociodemography Research Group and the Interdisciplinary Research Group on Immigration. And he teaches courses on social science research methods, migration, and international law. Get ready for this. His training is a combination of ecology, a bachelor's from Cornell University in 1997, law, a JD from Cornell in 2003, and demography with, a P demography with a PhD from Princeton University in 2013. Our third panelist is Julia Heslin, uh, MA and GIS consultant with Baltimore Green Map. Julia is currently an independent GIS consultant focused on using her geospatial skills to shed light on social and environmental injustices to invoke change. Currently, Julia works at Baltimore Green Map, where she is mapping green spaces of Northeast Baltimore and hosting those maps on ArcGIS Online as story maps. She participated in the NASA-developed national program at Goddard Space Flight Center last spring. Julia and her team utilized NASA Earth observations and citizen science data to create a mosquito habitat suitability map of Western Europe, and she will return to NASA Develop at Arizona State University this summer to work on an urban development project. So Rusty, cool. go ahead and introduce us. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I'm delighted to be the first speaker on this panel, this esteemed panel that, I ha that we have here. And I thought what I would do as the first speaker is to, to address the two questions that I get a lot, which is, you know, why is it important that we collect citizen science data when it comes to vectors and vector-borne disease? And the second question is, how can we trust the data that's collected by non-specialists? And so I'm hoping that in a very short period of time, I can um, address both of those issues in a way that, is, is, that makes sense to you. So um, just to start out, let's see, does this? The other arrow. The other arrow. <laughs> uh, yeah. Aha, thank you so much. OK, so um, when we developed the uh, Globe Observer Mosquito Habitat Mapper, um, our goal was to create something that could be used internationally because the GLOBE program, which has been around for over 20 years and is sponsored by NASA, NOAA, um, and um, especially um, uh, the NSF, and especially NASA has been the driver for this particular project. Um, it's been around for more than 20 years, and it's international, so we wanted to do something international. And as a result, what we did is we optim optimized the app for uh, two species of mosquito that are found internationally, which is the uh, yellow fever mosquito, which uh, started out in Africa and is now found on all the continents where you have um, land in the tropics and humid subtropics. And the, um, the uh, Asian tiger mosquito, which started out in Southeast Asia and is now found also 
in a, a co-occurring, relatively co-occurring kind of um, range distribution. And so this has been um, so this has been really where we've been working with this particular app. And um, one of the things that we've been doing, one of the reasons why we did this, is of course because of the changes that we have in disease in diseases today. And one of them is the the issue of Zika. And you know, I just got back from Hanoi um, doing mosquito trainings. About uh, I got back on on Saturday, and I flew on Korean Airlines. And um, this has never happened to me before. But when we got when we arrived in Korea. Um, we were to told by the flight attendants, um, if you have, you know, if you have a rash or if you have, you know, gotten a fever during this flight, please see our gate attendant. And, you know, this is what, the, what people are doing is we are now actively trying to change our behaviors and be aware. So we get, keep those pathogens away from the mosquitoes that are local in these, in these um, particular uh, countries. So I thought that was very interesting. I had never seen that before. But for us, you know, Zika is really um, a complete game changer. And the reason why is surveillance, human surveillance, the way that public health people talk about it, is really hard to do because the, d the disease mimics the um, the the, um, the symptoms of of dengue and chikungunya, so it's not really sure it's Zika. More than eighty percent of the people that are actually contract Zika are asymptomatic, so you don't know if you really have it. That wouldn't be a problem, except this is the first mosquito disease that we know about that is can be transmitted fairly easily through human contact, through intimate contact, or through fluids, and the big part of this is this is the one of the first the first mosquito borne disease that we know of that causes in birth defects in a percentage of those infected as public as a as a pregnant women and so this is really a game changer for us and so um, that is one of the reasons why we decided to go with this uh, globe uh, mosquito habitat mapper so when I was working, I've been working um, on a, a, a project that was funded by USAID in their portfolio on combating Zika and, uh, on future, and uh, future threats. And uh, when I'm talking to my uh, colleagues that I'm working with in Brazil and Peru, we all seem to have the same story, that you have a, a big m m outbreak of mosquitoes. Somehow, some of those mosquitoes come in contact with pathogens, and they're able to then potentially transmit those pathogens. You begin to fi fill up the... Uh, hospital beds, um, then people be become aware this is happening. And so there's money that is then allocated to the control and the surveillance and mitigation of these mosquito sites, right? And then the mosquitoes become less and less. And then um, the rainy season is over, or maybe winter starts, and the mosquitoes go, all go away, and everybody kind of forgets about it. And then that money is then reallocated to other things, and we kind of forget about it. We talked earlier today about how you know, Zika is no longer in the news, or West Nile virus right now isn't in the news. But we have very short memories when it comes to this. And then it takes you know, an El Nino or an extreme weather event or something else will happen if a year or two or three or five years later, and bang, the same things happen. So this is kind of the funding cycle that we're working with. And the result of all this is that we have inadequate surveillance worldwide. And so um, I was really interested in finding out, because um, I was hearing from my colleagues in Brazil, which would do an amazing job with their surveillance programs, and our, my colleagues in Peru, just, you know, what is it like in the States? You know, are we that much better? And so I came across this study from the National Association of County and City Health Officials, and they did this survey where they sent out more than 2,000 surveys. They had over a 53% uh, response rate. And basically, they just asked them, you know, according to the CDC framework for vector co control core competencies, you know, do you do these things, and uh, how are you doing, and how about the, some of these sub supplemental core competencies, do you do those? And the result of this study, which um, just was published last year, was that, wow, 8% of our vector control organizations are considered to be fully capable. 4% are competent, and 84% need improvement. And that was kind of a, kind of a shocking um, statistic for me. But if you look at the map of the United States, you can see we can, we can do a nice shout out to Louisiana and Delaware, which are the two states where we have a fully capable um, a vector control. And then the rest of the country is you know, severe, uh, you know, severely needing new resources. We are you know, in a p place that we are really well, um, very poorly equipped, ill-equipped to handle a pandemic. 
So uh, I don't need to talk about this part of it because uh, Antar and Ben and Mike did such a great job of talking about why we do surveillance of, um, of um, we use these um, uh, earth, observing pro uh, earth observing products as a way to get at doing surveillance because as a proxy for surveillance because we don't have it otherwise. And so yeah, that's incredibly important. And um, there are some really good outcomes that have come from that, from some of these models that have been produced. But you know, when, you come, when it comes right down to it, you know, if you have a disease like Zika or chikungunya where you don't have a, a vaccine, how can you reduce the risk? And there's only three, t three, um, three things that are available to us. And one of them is surveillance, right? The next one is getting rid of those sites, mitigating those sites, eliminating those, uh, those um, breeding sites. And the third thing is education. And so I'm proud to say that the uh, Globe Observer Mosquito Habitat Mapper actually does all three of these. Um, it is an international, um, it's a product made for international audiences, so it operates in several languages. And um, we are just ahead of the curve in terms of technology. When the, when the iPhone 10 came out, the first thing I did was run down to Apple Store and buy one, because not because I am an early adopter, but because I was hoping that the camera would be good enough to resolve 80 Zebelpictus from 80 Zagipti. <laughs> and I am sorry to say it's probably going to be the iPhone 12. But we're really getting close. We're really getting close. But until then, we have a little 4 or $5 um, macro lens that you can slip onto your camera and turn your phone into a very powerful little microscope. It's amazing. And so these are the, this is something that we have been distributing as part of the USAID project into these countries where we are partnering right now. Uh, the app is really easy to use. You just, here's a, a mosquito dipper right here. You grab some mosquitoes, you take this out into the field, and you answer a bunch of questions. Um, and um, our app, uh, unlike the one that um, J uh, John is going to be talking about today, we're looking at larva. And we decided to use larva because uh, larva and pupa are used uh, to create indexes by many, in many countries when they're doing their surveillance. So we thought it was very compatible. Um, there are four steps in our app. You locate and describe uh, where the, uh, the site is. And then you take a sample of mosquitoes and you count how many of the larvae that you find and how many of the pupa that you find. Uh, these immature forms of mosquitoes, and then you photograph, and then using a dichotomous key that's built into the app, you identify it, and then lastly, you report whether or not you were able to decommission or um, eliminate that site. So, um, so this is just a screenshot of um, you know what it looks like. You know what is the source of the water, and it's really interesting because working in using this app in this in the pilot, um, the work in Brazil and in Peru and Barbuda, we find that there are pla in different places there are places where the uh, mosquitoes are more ubiquitous. So, for instance, in Brazil, just about every bromeliad that we sampled had tons of mosquitoes. You know, in the water that was ponding in the plant, um, in um, in uh, Barbuda. We didn't, ha we didn't have that at all, but tires were, were the big thing. And of course, tires are very well known as, as excellent breeding sites for um, Aedes uh, albopictus and aegypti. So you really can't see this picture, can you? But it's a, it's a, it's a nice uh, woman uh, in Vietnam that she had just found this mosquito, took a picture of it um, using the mosquito habitat mapper. And then that picture comes up, on the, um, comes up in the app and then you can compare it to pictures of uh, mosquitoes that have been taken as well as um, diagrams that you can resolve all the, um, all the features of the mosquito and then de determine whether or not it's one of the genera that's supported by the app. Um, so we are a baby program because we haven't been around even for a year yet. So I'm afraid our data sp uh, scatter here is not going to be nearly as impressive as what you're going to see with a uh, a mosquito alert by John in a couple minutes, but we you know we have about 250 or so um, uh, data sites at this present time. You can see in in Brazil, there's a big cluster there where we were doing some um, some pilot work. There's a big cluster in Thailand where we were doing some pilot work, and so um, there it's a very it's it's this is a very nice scientific visualization of the of the data worldwide. Um, you can actually zoom into the data. You can get a street level, and this is something that excites a lot of our public um, health partners who do not have digital ways of collecting data. Um, if you click on any one of those dots, the metadata comes up, including uh, photo, you know, 
what we call you know um, photo voucher specimens. So you can say, oh yeah, that that looks like it really is an 80s albopictus, or that is really an 80s agypti. All right, yeah, I think this data is correct. And then in the back end, we have a bunch of people, including the woman, uh, Kristen, who is just up here telling you about that job. Uh, we all uh, take turns looking at the data on the back end and making sure that the data is correct. Okay, so there's been a lot of excitement about all this. Um, uh, uh, you know, John and I, um, our projects were very lucky to be part of the PBS special crowd in the cloud and be sp uh, found there. Uh, we are uh, working with the field crews right now. Um, they're interested in using our data in some ground ver uh, validation research. Uh, we're working with the Public um, Health Department of Peru, which is interested in using this in an educational setting in schools. And so, um, to make a long story short, people are interested in this product for different reasons. But um, I'd like to leave you with the, um, this very exciting thing, which ties into, the, I think, the satellite part of, this, of the work that we're doing today. Because one of the problems that we have is how do we take um, relatively coarse resolution environmental data and then downscale it so you can actually look at the data that's collected in, you know, the ground validation data that's collected by the citizen scientists. And um, we're going to be releasing a new app on the Globe Observer platform. It's called Land Cover Adopt a Pixel. And um, if, if a student, if, if anyone who's using this app collects both mosquito data and Adopt a Pixel data, this is going to be, I think, maybe one of the ways that we're going to be able to um, sort of uh, mathematically re reconcile these two data sets. Because as you'll find out when Julia's talking, you know, land cover is one of the, um, the data sets that has been very useful in development of models of, um, that we use to um, do forecasting and, predi and projection of future disease areas. And so that's all I have to say. Um, thank you very much. Um, we, we are, we're, we're a very big team, and um, it's been very exciting to work on this project, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thanks a lot. So thank you very much. Uh, as Rusty said, we're going to move now from larva to adults, and I'm going to give you an, an example of a citizen science uh, project aimed at uh, the research, surveillance, and management of adult uh, tiger mosquitoes and yellow fever mosquitoes. And think about ways, again, that we can evaluate what this gives us, both for, for scientific research as well as for management, and well as, the, as well as the overarching theme of how this ties in to Earth observation products, and in particular, how those products are useful for adding to the models that we get from this data, but also how this data can be used, uh, as Rusty was saying, sort of as a ground truth for some of those products. Uh, and one of the things that I notice in, in thinking about all these talks is that I often think about with the citizen science data, looking for another source of ground truth for that data. So, so that's a little bit what I'll talk about. Um, so it's. So this is the starting point here. This is an adult uh, tiger mosquito. And the key here is not the image, which you obviously will most likely recognize, but the fact that it was taken by a non-professional scientist. This was taken by a citizen scientist participating in mosquito alert. We consider mosquito alert an expert validated citizen science system for uh, research surveillance and management of disease vector mosquitoes. And, and specifically, we, we focus on the tiger and yellow fever mosquito. So key features that we built into the system are first that it provides a simple mechanism for people to generate geolocated uh, reports, including photographs of mosquitoes that they identify based on a simple uh, taxonomic key. We then take those photographs and we feed them into an expert validation system. So we have a team of entomologists who look at the photographs and score whether they think they're tiger mosquitoes or yellow fever mosquitoes, and in fact, the, the level of probability that they, that they are, or simply whether that's not identifiable. Uh, and we also have a crowd-based validation system as well. So other citizen scientists, uh, through the app itself or, or online, through a web platform, can also do their own validation. Another key feature is that we estimate sampling effort. So we use optional, anonymized background location tracking in order to distinguish whether places that we don't have mosquito reports coming from are in fact free of mosquitoes or simply free of citizen scientists. 
<laughs> and then finally, we have channels for co direct communication between the citizen scientists, between the experts, and between the public health managers and the public at large so that the information is being fed back and forth. Citizens get feedback about the quality of their reports. Citizens and the general public get feedback about mosquito risk levels. Uh, we have a, a particular system for public health managers to get data uh, directly from the system and the data that's most useful for them. Other important features are that this, everything we do is free and open source. Uh, we are uh, considering this part of the, the emerging global mosquito alert toolkit. And uh, so to date, we've had approximately, uh, we, in fact, we've had more than 40,000 participants generating more than uh, 12,000 reports. And this has been operating for ab about four years, uh, focused in Spain. So, okay, how do we evaluate the system? Um, so we thought about this a lot, and we, we published a paper this past fall, which, which you can look at in detail, and I'll go through some of the key findings. Um, so the first uh, sort of the first um, parameter on which we, we do our evaluation is thinking about scalability. And we immediately see that the citizen science approach is inherently more scalable than what we get from traditional uh, surveillance methods. So traditional approaches to surveilling uh, tiger mosquitoes would involve OV traps. The picture on the top left here shows you essentially all of the OV traps in Spain during 2014 and 2015. And they're concentrated, obviously, in the, on the edges of the places where we already knew that there were tiger mosquitoes present. But they cost a lot of money. And the problem with OV trap surveillance is that, that those costs scale somewhat linearly with geographic area covered. Because you cover more area, you need more OV traps, you need more people to go out and check the OV traps. And so you tend to limit where you put them to the places where you think you're going to see the mosquito next. In comparison, the picture on the top right is the sampling effort from Mosquito Alert. So this is where we had people using and participating with the application in Spain. And then the bottom image is our sampling effort for the entire world. And this is just during that 2014 to 2015 period. Um, if we think about it in terms of cost, and it's a little bit difficult to estimate the cost of these things, but our estimate was that the citizen science approach was approximately one-eighth the cost of traditional OV trap surveillance. Uh, and we have the actual estimates per kilometer, uh, per square kilometer per month. Okay, but how well does this actually do? Because obviously, if the traditional methods are giving us the information that we want and the citizen science is fun but it doesn't do anything for us, then the lower cost isn't really very important. So in terms of simply early warning, here is the picture that we have for municipalities in uh, right here in, on the uh, eastern coast of Spain, which is primarily the, the, the focus of the tiger mosquito invasion. Uh, municipalities which we already knew m tiger mosquitoes were present in, which we see here in gray. Municipalities for which OV traps alone provided the first detection, which we see in blue. Municipalities for which citizen science alone provided the first detection, meaning the mosquito alert system, which we see in here, it looks green, and if you look at it uh, online, it may look yellow to you. Um, and then we have red, which is both, because sometimes it's hard to distinguish because we had reports coming in at the same time. And the first interesting thing is, well, we, we got a lot of early warning in new municipalities based on citizen science, things, information that we did not know with OV traps alone. And secondly, what's interesting is if you look, you can see a little bit the pattern here, which is that the citizen science first detections tend to be farther from the known invasion area, right? And that's, that makes sense because, as I said, you tend to put OV traps along the edge of that known invasion area. But the problem is that tiger mosquitoes are jumpy, right? They, they are moving fast. In fact, what we're finding is one of the reasons they're moving fast is that they're hitchhiking in cars. So they go beyond those known invasion areas very fast. And the advantage of citizen science is it lets you actually get those detections where you wouldn't think of putting OV traps. This is just a way of quantifying that information. The, um, I'm not sure how well you can see the colors, but basically the, uh, the top uh, box plot and the, um, the, the density distribution on, on the big spike on the right, those are the OV mosquito alert alone first detection, so much farther from the edge of the known invasion area than the others. What about what we really care, care about in terms of modeling disease uh, spreading? And that is actually human mosquito encounters. And here, just right off the bat, we know that citizen science gives us something better than OV traps because it actually does give us more information about humans encountering these mosquitoes, not just a pot of water encountering the mosquito. Um, and so based on the data, because we have so much of it, 
were able to actually put together models at a very fine resolution, and this is at the level of municipalities, but in fact we have even finer resolution uh, estimates of the tiger mosquito distribution. In fact, we call it the tiger mosquito risk, but it's really the risk of human mosquito encounters. So we get fine resolution in terms of space, we get fine resolution in terms of time, because again, unlike OV traps, which you have to decide how often you're gonna put them out, we're continuously getting this data, so we have daily predictions of human mosquito encounter risk. Uh, and again, though, we wanna know, is this actually the real risk, or is this just something that looks nice on a map and doesn't really tell us much? So here's where the ground truth that I'm interested in comes in, and of course the problem is, where do you look for ground truth for human mosquito interactions? We don't really have another good source, so in fact I turn to traditional methods, and we look here at comparing what we get from OV traps in terms of that mosquito distribution to what we get from uh, mosquito alert, in the areas for which we had OV trapping and mosquito alert surveillance together, right? So we have these limited areas along the coast where we can really compare the results. We can pretend that OV traps are the ground truth. We know they're not. We know they're imperfect, but we can pretend they're the ground truth. And if they are, and if we then um, evaluate our results based on that ground truth, we find that we actually do really well. So this is the, the graph on the bottom is an area under the curve plot. And if we would be getting a diagonal line, that would mean that our predictions are basically no better than random in terms of predicting OV trap eggs. But what we see is we have actually quite large areas under the curve. We have approximately 0.78 or 0.84, depending on whether we do our comparison to actual egg presence or to the modeled results that we have from the OV traps. And translated into actual um, real numbers, that means, for example, of the true positives from the OV trap, we predict approximately 84% of those using mosquito alert, and of the true negatives, we predict approximately 75% of them. The other thing that we get is thick data. So we talk about big data a lot of the times, but sometimes we're actually interested in something beyond that. And what I mean by thickness is we get a lot of interesting, important qualitative information from this data. So we have people sending us information about all the breeding sites that they're finding. So we get a lot of information about what these breeding sites look like. We can ask people through the app to tell us about mosquitoes traveling in cars because that's something we were interested in and all of a sudden we get a whole bunch of pictures of dead mosquitoes in cars. <laughs> uh, we can use this very high resolution, uh, these high resolution estimates of mosquito risk in order to then learn things about how mosquitoes are moving across provinces. And so this is a graph showing the flow, our estimates of the flow of tiger mosquitoes between provinces in Spain based on commuting patterns and where that ri those risks are. Uh, and here, this is, this, if you look at the online version of the slides, it'll, it'll play, I think it's not gonna play on this, but this is a daily uh, risk map of, of Catalonia. And so you can see you can get these rich daily predictions. Okay, um, future directions, where, where are we taking this? So right now we're quite happy with, with the extent to which uh, citizen science can provide a really valuable tool for uh, for understanding and, and managing disease vector mosquitoes. We'd like to use now our results to start refining our habitat suitability models. Uh, and that's something we were obviously talking about in the other panels. And I think this can add a lot to that. And I think that the, the Earth observation products that, that we've been talking about can add a lot to these models now. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward to doing that. And that's one of the things that we're working with the, the develop team on doing. And the develop team really helped us with a lot. Uh, we're also, I'm saying, uh, putting together uh, now casting. So we have these estimates that we did for these two years, but we're going to make this a, a near real-time system so that we get um, risks, at least now, you know, present risks, that are immediately put, given back to the public. Right now we have a web map where you can see all of the reports, but we'll, we'll have our models being constantly updated and also fed back to the public and to the disease, uh, to the public health managers. Having heard the presentations before, I think perhaps I should be... Uh, confident enough to say forecasting and actually jump off that cliff. <laughs> um, we also are improving the, pub the, man the management portals that we make available to, to public health agencies, and we've been working with, with municipal level public health agencies across Spain, and they're very interested in this. Um, as I said earlier, we've been working with Anne and with, our, with Rusty and with other partners on the Global uh, Mosquito Alert Initiative, and so we're seeing this as, this as part of an, a broader toolkit that people can draw on uh, depending on their particular situation, and either clone our software or directly use what we're doing um, and, and try to solve um, disease vector mosquito problems. Uh, and then, of course, funding. We're, we're looking for a sustainable source of funding. And as in many citizen science projects, that does not prove to be easy. Applicability to other vectors. 
three important questions to keep in mind. One is identification. So what's nice about tiger mosquitoes and yellow fever mosquitoes is they're pretty easy to identify. So that's a consideration you would want to think about in terms of other vectors that you might want to use citizen science for. Citizen motivation, and by that I really mean in the case of mosquitoes, what's the annoyance factor? So tiger mosquitoes are very, very annoying. So that helps to make sure that people use our application. Uh, and then how, how the information can actually be used for public health. So for more information, you're welcome to see our website, and um, uh, I'll be happy to talk more and answer questions later. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you again to Anne and Dorian for inviting me back to the Wilson Center. It's a great honor to be a part of a pa esteemed panel, like Rusty had said, um, and talking about this important research. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about this project that I worked on at the NASA Develop Program at Goddard Space Flight Center um, on mapping mosquito habitat suitability in Western Europe. So I'll talk a little bit about the Develop Program itself. Um, go into more detail about the project, and in doing so, uh, that hopefully validating the importance of citizen science, um, maybe some of the errors and, and uncertainties that arose, and so maybe like some next steps that we need to take uh, in citizen science. Okay, so the NASA Developed National Program integrates NASA Earth observations uh, with community concerns to conduct these short-term 10-week feasibility projects that build capacity in not only the participants of the program, but also uh, the project partners and decision makers that are participating with us. Um, and so an important aspect that I mentioned is integrating these NASA Earth observations, but for our particular project with the Western Europe Health and Air Quality team, uh, these citizen science data were very integral in our project. All right, so a little bit about mission and core values. So DEVELOP um, seeks to foster future innovation, but also collaboration, discovery, service, and passion amongst uh, its future, or its participants who are future professionals and current professionals um, by addressing these environmental issues going on today. And so NASA DEVELOP uh, operates in a few different areas of what we call nodes. So the closest one here is Goddard Space Flight Center, but kind of uh, evenly spread across uh, the US, with the exception maybe of the Great Plains. Um, so a little bit um, about our project. So we wanted to go over these community concerns that a lot of you, I'm sure, are aware of. Um, so mosquito-borne illnesses, in particular, can possibly kill over a million people a year. Um, these vector-borne diseases include yellow fever, Zika, chikungunya, dengue, and malaria. And with the uh, rising temperatures and changes in uh, Earth's climate, uh, these ra the range of mosquito habitat is spreading. And so I'd like to um, also identify some of the, our project partners that we worked with, including the Global Mosquito Alert Consortium here at the Wilson Center. Um, okay, so the objectives of our project was to integrate the citizen science data and NASA Earth observations in order to make uh, this information on habitat suitability for mosquitoes more publicly accessible. And we did this by creating an interactive map of habitat suitability using Google Earth Engine. And we also wanted to use the habitat suitability model and overlay uh, other socioeconomic and different layers like transportation, uh, population, and public health data. All right. Um, so the citizen science data that we gathered, that we were uh, given, were um, from Belgium, Italy, the Netherlands, and Spain, um, and had a range of uh, a t various temporal ranges, but all of them overlaid from June 2016 to September 2017. And 
so this was a continuation of the first part of Western Europe Health and Air Quality Team, where they conducted the habitat suitability analysis, but with uh, the second part, we utilized Google Earth Engine to Google Earth Engine to host the habitat suitability model on. And uh, in addition to the citizen science data, we included these NASA Earth observation environmental factors, which included elevation, humidity, land surface temperature, NDVI, precipitation, and soil moisture, all of which can be important in predicting habitat suitability for mosquitoes. All right, I won't get too in the weeds about the methodology, but in short, um, we used uh, the maximum entropy or maxent habitat suitability model to integrate the citizen science data points uh, with the environmental data. Um, ran it through the maxent model to conduct that suitability for uh, all of Western Europe, and then host the uh, habitat suitability on Google Earth Engine as an interactive habitat suitability model. And here you can see the results from uh, that analysis where uh, the blue areas indicate a low probability of mosquito habitat suitability. And then as you progress to red, higher uh, probability of mosquito habitat suitability. And then you can see the range of the area under the curve values on the right there uh, for the range of data that we worked with. All right, so a little bit about the results from this analysis. So there were some clear relationships between um, these individual vari uh, of the mosquito uh, data and these environmental variables. So NDVI, uh, land surface temperature, soil moisture precipitation, um, they were all positively correlated with mosquito presence. So in other words, uh, the higher the probability of mosquito presence, the higher uh, these variables were. So like higher land surface temperature indicates or uh, could possibly explain higher amounts of mosquito presence. Elevation, however, was negatively correlated with mosquito presence, meaning lower elevations indicated a higher probability of mosquito presence. And then we also found another interesting result was that the importance of environmental, the environmental variable importance was contingent upon this particular season. So for instance, in the summer, um, there is more of a, a normal distribution of variables um, where like each variable was equally, almost equally important in predicting habitat suitability for mosquitoes, whereas in the winter months, um, elevation was uh, the top variable that predicted mosquito importance, and the other ones were very low. Um, so a little bit about the errors and uncertainties that came about from our project. So with the citizen science data that we were given, there uh, weren't any absence data, and if there had been absence data included in the citizen science data, then we could have had a wider variety of methodologies that we could have chosen from, but uh, Maxent implements a presence only um, data, so that's why we went with that. And we also noticed in the citizen science data that there could have been like spikes in reporting of mosquito presence based on uh, like media events that were hosted. So if um, a media event that people went to learn about the app, to record uh, mosquito presence, there was a spike in those data directly after that event, but then like dwindled off um, thereafter. Uh, also, an important thing to note is the reporting bias in um, more populated areas. So areas that more people exist obviously are gonna have a higher amount of uh, mosquito presence reported there. And then finally, um, some data sets needing to be distinguished between mosquito larvae and the mosqui adult mosquitoes themselves uh, was not existent. Okay, so for some next steps or future work, uh, 
that we could encourage citizen science to take would be including these absence data um, and then also uh, indicating species distinction, which I know some data, uh, data sets have in, did include. Um, and then also with our suitability model inputting more uh, environmental data into the model. It was only a 10 week project, so it was hard to include, gather data for as many variables as we had wanted to. But um, I think for future work, like broadening the, uh, or like gathering more of these data that could predict habitat suitability for mosquitoes would be important. And then finally, um, these citizen science data, as I mentioned, came from Italy, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Spain. So I think if there was a more uh, stratified sample across all, all countries in Western Europe would have given us a more, um, a per or a more predictive suitability model for mosquitoes. And then I wanted to show you all um, some of the results from our um, habitat suitabil suitability model hosted on Google Earth Engine. Um, so you can see, you can select the date range that you, or the month that you wanna see the data, go to the specific country, and then select from these list of uh, variables that we incorporated into the habitat suitability model. And then finally, you can visualize the final habitat suitability, suitability model um, by each month from our date range from June 2016 to September 2017. And then just like this project couldn't have been done without our citizen science data, it could have been done without all uh, these people listed, uh, science advisors, other scientists at NASA, and the Wilson Center Global Mosquito Alert Consortium. And uh, thank you. All right, thanks to all three of you. Um, I gave you some questions to prepare and I don't think I'm going to ask any of them, so a uh, brief apology there. We talked about data a lot and we talked about decisions in terms of individuals making decisions like dumping out buckets of water or destroying habitats, um, influencing decision making on municipal levels, and then also triangulating citizen science data with NASA Earth Ops to be able to create suitability maps, which could theoretically also feed directly into decision making. I think these are both hypothetical and to some degree already happening. And I'm wondering if the panel would like to comment on how far we are to using citizen science as a tool to influence instant decision making by individuals and by professionals or public health officials or private sector decision makers on a range of scales from local to national to global contexts. Why are you looking at me, John? <laughs> so, so uh, I, I, yeah, I can, I can talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So, so first of all, decision making by individuals is, I think that's a really interesting point. And that's one of, one of the things that I didn't focus on was the feedback of information back to the citizen scientists to help them make decisions and to help them learn about how to reduce risks. Of course, that's a, that's a big, it's a big advantage of, of these, these types of approaches. Um, it gives people a direct information about how removing water can improve the quality of their life. One of the things I think that it has the potential to do, which we need to work on more in the future, is to overcome what I see as kind of a collective action problem. Because when you talk to people, at least around the areas I am in Spain, about why they don't dump water out in their backyards, they often say, well, because I know my neighbor's not going to do it, and the mosquitoes are going to fly here anyways. And so there needs to be a way of getting groups of people all in within um, you know, local areas to all get together and agree to reduce water. And in a way, these citizen science programs can help to do that. In terms of decision making by public health managers, that's something that we already see happening. So the Barcelona Public Health Agency sp makes decisions uh, all the time about where to go out and do control efforts based on our data. Other municipal public health agencies are, are doing that more and more. So we know that that's happening and that's one of the things that we're trying to increase by having uh, better public health portals by, by expanding and, and really working more and more closely with these public health agencies. 
I think that's great. And John is able to talk about that a lot more because he has actually a relatively robust data set, whereas we're still in the very, in very nascent place where the data is across the world and of small numbers. Um, so we have not yet been able to um, um, see actual use of the data. But what I will tell you that I think is really fantastic is the fact that when you, when uh, people are using the app, um, they are re you know they are learning about the fact that you know making you know doing observations, finding those sites, reporting those sites, and then destroying those sites so they're not used for breeding is a really really critical. So there's a huge educational piece to this. That's not why we did it, but it turns out that that's really one of the the early. Um, really early successes that we're having. And, um, you know, it, what we need to really do is change behavior. And that's that's the important thing. You know, throughout my whole life, you know, living in, in Maryland, I came from the Maryland here, and, um, you know, I, I was used to at night, you know, the, 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 foggy mach the foggy machines going through and you have to close your windows because they're fogging for mosquitoes. And there's a, sort of this idea that that's someone else's job. And But when you get to something like um, the um, tiger mosquito, the Asian tiger mosquito and the yellow fever mosquito, you know, these guys are different. You know, they, the bed nets is not a really great solution as it is with Anopheles because these guys are active during the day, whereas Anopheles are pretty much active during the night. And then, you know, they're, and, and like uh, Bernadette said, you know, um, they can lay their eggs in, in bottle caps. So we can't apply larvicide, you know, in an effective way for these mosquitoes. So this is really a, a, a real challenge that requires changes in human behavior. And I think that's one of the things that the, that the, um, the apps that we're developing and the Global Mosquito Alert Consortium is trying to do. Yeah, I agree with all that's been said. Um, I think in terms of using or how far we are in citizen science data used to be used in decision making, I think like utilizing citizen science data in the way that NASA Develop has or like another uh, research projects that scientists have conducted is like a stepping stone towards that. Um, so like validating the importance of citizen science data. Um, yeah. And, you know, just to make as another side is like, you know, we really want to think of carefully. And one of the reasons I want to come to this um, session and be really part of this whole meeting today is how can the data that we collect be more useful? And because of the developed folks, they, you know, we, we had them look at our data and as they were working with John's data and taking a look at our data and they said, you know, if you've got continuous data, that's really going to be a problem for us because of our models that we use. And so, you know, we actually changed our apps so that we have discrete data Data, as opposed to categorical data that, can, that is being collected. And so that's, that's another important feedback as well. Um, so, you know, we really want to see this data being used. Um, what we're seeing right now is that, you know, at, at the scale we are now, um, what I sort of envision is, you know, creating these ideas where you might have bio blitzes, where you have a scientist, we have a scientist that we're working with at the uh, School of Public Health in Denver, who's really interested in, in um, West Nile virus. And so she can, she can, she's interested in asking a question about the different kinds of habitats. And then if we can put that out as a push message in the app, then people in that region where she's doing research can actually collect that data and crowdsource that research. And so I think in the early stages, um, that's what we're going to be able to do. We're hoping that in a few years, I mean, it really will take a couple years before we have sufficient data that we can actually begin to articulate really effectively with, with um, our Earth observations. But I think it will come. Is there an audience question? Romerutin, Johnson & Johnson. Uh, we heard a lot of modeling uh, this morning and also that validating of validation of those models is quite difficult sometimes because lack of good surveillance data. It looks like the citizen science data could be an answer to that. So my question is, is that data also available and open to be used by anyone that wants to use that? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, both both uh, John's data and also the data from the Globe Observer Mosquito Habitat Mapper is completely open data. You could open up your computer right now, go to the portal, and look at the scientific visualizations, and then download it as a, as a .csv file or as a KMZ file. So we have that. We certainly have that capability. And in the broader uh, perspective of this um, sort of international project, the Global Mosquito Alert. We're also committed to the open data aspect. 
Yeah. No, that was a good point. Um, I think, but also ensuring that those citizen science data are validated by scientists before um, like the public uses it would be, is like an important way to vet the data to make sure that it's valid. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was going to add just one thing along those lines. It's, it's, it's not only important to, to do the validation of the citizen science data in terms of the quality that's of, for instance, of the reports that are coming in, but I think it's important to continually do the type of, of ground truth type validation that I talked about because even though I was quite happy with the results we have, I'm not confident that that won't change because you're dealing with citizens reporting and you're dealing with human behavior, that behavior can change. So it's, I think it's important to constantly calibrate our models against different sources of ground truth. Um, and then we can use that as well, as you're saying, as a way of validating other sources of data. And I would just add that this is something that Julia's NASA Develop Project helped us pilot, is bringing together these different citizen science data sources on vector monitoring into a single space and working towards making that available as a real-time open data portal. So <laughs> the first panel had a really great Ray Bradbury quotation. He's one of my favorite authors. Jump off cliffs and build your wings on the way down. I was wondering if you could reflect on how this is relevant to citizen science and to <laughs> mosquito monitoring projects. Yeah, I think that's a great quote, and I love that too. And I wrote it down that I want to look at that later. Um, yeah, this is a this is one of the issues because when you're working with NASA, for instance, um, as the Globe Observer Mosquito Habitat Mapper is a NASA product, and the question that I'm getting all the time as the lead scientist is like, okay, how can we use this? How can we use connect this to Earth observations? What can we do? You've got to get scientists involved, you know. And the fact of the matter is, scientists need enough data to make it worth their while. And so that's what we are doing, is we are, um, we, are we are building it and then trying to figure out how we're going to use it in the future, because we do need to have a corpus of data so that we're actually able to do those analyses. So I thought that was a really good question, that was a really, really good quote for us. I, I, I agree. Um, you know, I have, to, I have to be honest, we've been very, I think we've jumped off a cliff in terms of things like, okay, let's get this app out there. In terms of software development, we tend to try to move very fast and then we try to fix things as, they, as we go. And that, that works very well. We've been very cautious though in terms of the information that we're providing to the public and to the public health agencies. And I think that part of that has to do with the fact that citizen science often is not accepted as the same quality as other sources of information. And initially we didn't have a lot of interest, interest in our project from the public health agencies uh, right. in Spain. And it was only over time as the project attracted more and more participants and as, and as I think the agencies started to see how valuable the data was that they became interested. But we've always been very, very cautious, particularly on the public health side and making sure that we're really not overstepping what we can provide. As I said, perhaps we shouldn't be. And, and this is motivating me to think to jump more. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Yeah, it just made me think about, um, that quote made me think about how the develop program operates in these short-term feasibility projects that you just have to like jump into it and like figure it out on the way if like you run into a problem and then at the end like you'll eventually fly. <laughs> Is there another audience question in the back? Uh, Henry Hecker, retired government. I, I imagine you remember uh, the television coverage of Aerial Spring in Miami uh, to fight Zika, to reduce the number of mosquitoes dramatically and cause a lot of uh, concern uh, among citizens, uh, which wondered, should we be outdoors? Do they need to stay indoors? Uh, I can't remember exactly what they had to say about all that, but the concern was clearly there. The other option is uh, citizen awareness to reduce standing water to fight mosquitoes, to reduce their numbers in some way. What do you folks think is the best way to do this? Either the aerial spraying technique, fogging, or uh, trying to reduce the water, the standing water? Hmm. You want to take that, John? I, you know, to, to be honest, I don't, I don't have a strong opinion about that. I don't, I don't think I'm in really in a good position to assess spraying, for example, in terms of the, because you, you, you talk a little bit about the information flow and this, people's reaction to that. And I think there, there's some, there's certain things where, where a citizen science approach can be very useful for giving information to the public and other things where it, where maybe should not be the primary tool. And I think for the spraying, perhaps citizen science, you know, for instance, giving a, you know, 
an alert through our app to people there's going to be spraying in their neighborhood, I wouldn't recommend that, or at least as the, as the main source of information, because we do have a limited number of people. Um, things like reduce your water tends to work a lot more, right? So if, if all the people who use our app know to reduce their water, they just little by little tell their neighbors, that type of thing spreads. But we're going to spray next week should be more of you know, radios and, and pamphlets and things like mm -hmm. that. And in terms of effectiveness, those are not the only tools that we have available to us. You know, um, you know there has been um, a lot of research in looking at use, the use of um, biological um, ways, like the, the Gambia fish or um, the... Um, the, the, the uh, Toxiorenchites mosquito, uh, cannibal mosquitoes, um, you know, uh, working with the uh, World uh, Mosquito Project. They're working with the, um, the Volbachia um, uh, bacteria that they put in the mosquitoes. And it's, it's, a real, it's a natural thing that's found in other species, just not in uh, the, the Asian tiger mosquito and the yellow fever mosquito. And they're having great success with that in Brazil a year later after they, they seeded with these mosquitoes that had this um, bacteria, 90% uh, of the mosquitoes in the test region are um, not able to um, contract or transmit um, um, some of these diseases, including dengue. So it's so I think there are some other tools that are really effective to us. But you know, when you're talking about um, these container mosquitoes that tend to live really close to people, live in human habitats, live in our buckets and our cups and trash. You know, um, I think that we really need to uh, mount a campaign about awareness. And, you know, traveling through South America, there are billboards everywhere. You know, dump your water. Six minutes a week, take care of it. Or is it eight minutes a week? You know, do a look around, find the water. So we're realizing that this is going to be, this is a really important way of dealing with this one particular, these these two particular kinds of mosquitoes because their behavior is different and where they're living is different. They fly and, you know, they don't fly, um, you know, six miles like the mosquitoes from the salt marshes. They might fly only 100 meters in their lifetime, which means that habitat removal around your house is going to make a health difference. I would add from a meta perspective that it would be helpful to have a toolkit um, of different control strategies that were grouped by different contexts, whether it's locality or um, mosquito species that citizen science volunteers could leverage as well. I think we have time for one final question. Hi, it's Bernadette Dunham again. Um, I think this is fantastic. And talking to students at universities, they are the ones I know very specifically want to try to make a difference. And so this awareness of I can do a very small thing, but it really can add to the data is fantastic. The question I had was, how much do you get an opportunity to reach out to schools, uh -huh. schools and be in a really good way of having our youth get engaged and be educated and do just what you've been asking for? Hey, Bernadette, I'll take that question. Um, so because that's actually what I, what I did for this um, USAID project for combating Zika and future threats. The pitch that I made is that the youth can be, you know, a, a, a profound um, a change agent for, for uh, vector-borne disease. And so the project that I was leading actually in Brazil and Peru, we were working with um, about 200 teachers and their, and their students and getting them involved in science fair type projects where they collect the data, they learn, about, they learn about the mosquitoes, and they are also empowered to improve the health in their communities. And I think it is a very effective model. And in fact, um, on the basis of the pilot we, that we did, um, the U.S. State Department has, um, has released a, a grant where we're now going to be able to do this um, in, I can't remember now, I think it's 20 countries um, on three continents. Um, working with schools and kids. Um, so I, I really believe that youth are really engaged. They want to make a difference. They want to be empowered. And this is something that they can do because maybe their parents are too busy. And so that's one thing that I think is really exciting. And do you have kids working with uh, your app as well? So actually, so we do a lot of outreach in schools. I personally don't, but we have a whole team that does that. And, and they also have a great response Interestingly, we actually started this as an app targeted towards primary school children. So the, in 2013, we released, we released it as Atrapa el Tigre, which makes sense in, in Catalan and Spanish. And we thought that, that, we thought that children using the app were going to be really the key. But of course, we didn't want children using the app without adult supervision. So it was always with a, with a teacher. It was always sort of through these, these um, events. 
And we realized that adults were actually much more interested because they were getting bitten, and, and they were the ones who we felt more comfortable actually using the app. So the app is the app. Ch we changed it a lot in in the, the, re the release after the, the following year. Uh, so it is more targeted to adults, but we do at the same time, as you said, we do a lot of outreach in schools. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with what's been said. Um, Rusty had mentioned bio blitzes, and um, I think that's a good way of getting kids involved, like K through 12, in this research and citizen science in general. Um, yeah, I worked with the Maryland Geographic Alliance for a little bit, and that's why I identify as like an independent GIS consultant. I've just had like a bunch <laughs> of different jobs over the years, so that's what I'm sticking with. But um, yeah, the Maryland Geographic Alliance, one of the initiatives was bioblisses, which is just to track as many species in like a set area uh, during like the day. Um, so I think integrating these different mosquito uh, presence gathering data uh, data apps would uh, be like a good way of getting kids involved in that. Yeah, in addition to the engagement, there's also a lot of work um, being done on the learning outcomes associated with citizen science, including improving topical knowledge and then uh, accelerating the STEM pipeline. So there is definitely value from the engagement end. Okay, well, I have been told that there's coffee outside or will be shortly. So thank you very much. <laughs>